My name is Mr. Phillips. Some of you know me. I think uh, you've been my students before. Uh, some of you don't know me, and uh, if you don't know me, you're very lucky. <laughs> um, I'm sorry we don't have enough seats for everyone, but maybe we can bring in some chairs for you so you'll be a little more comfortable in the back. Or maybe if you know someone, you don't mind sharing the seat. Um, this course in nationalism and imperialism covers an area in history, in world history, which encompasses two major wars, World War I and World War II. Now, there are certain events, any large event in history, any serious event, must have some after effects. And World War I has had a number of after effects. The world was never the same after World War I. It gave birth to communism, it gave birth to fascism, and to another form of fascism called Nazism. And then came World War II, and that left a lasting effect upon us. As a matter of fact, one of the shocking things that came out of World War II is that man, after he has reached a very high pinnacle or level of knowledge, of technology, of literature, of music, uh, that man could still be a very cruel animal. You know, many times we prided ourselves that a civilized man is a very fine... Just the volume control must be turned down just a little bit. No, it's fine, it's fine, it's right there. That's good, a little that down. Germany was always known as a very civilized nation. I mean, it's the nation of Goethe, the great uh, poet. It's the, it's the nation of Beethoven, it's the nation of great engineering. They were well known for their medical and surgical tools. That Germany should be able to stoop so low as to devise death camps, camps in which the product was how do you kill people quickly and efficiently and cheaply. That's what it is, death camp. That a nation like that could do that uh, was shocking to the world. We couldn't believe it because it was a condemnation of us. It meant that, listen, I'm a civilized man, and I uh, like music, and I like literature, and maybe I'm a beast, too. Well, that led to the Holocaust. I think you've seen films on it, you've seen film strips, you've seen movies, you've seen exhibits. We're very fortunate today to have with us Mrs. Isra. Mrs. Isra is a survivor of Auschwitz and of Birkenau, as you're going to hear. And uh, aside from the fact that I know Mrs. Isra for many, many years, we're very, we have been very close friends, we're also related. You see, she has a very talented young son who married my very talented young daughter. <laughs> so, so we are related. We cemented our friendship of uh, more than uh, almost 30 years. 30 uh, we cemented it with a marriage about four, four and a half, five years ago. And uh, so, but Mrs. Isaroff has a tattoo here. It's a serial number from Auschwitz. You won't be able to see it because she's wearing a, a rather long sleeve. And she was known as... Uh, A6171. That, that was her number. She's never spoken about her experiences before, and when Mr. Stern asked me, you know, can we get a resource person, someone who's been in the camps and who had experiences, I said, yes, I don't know if she wants to come or whether, because it's not easy for her to talk about it, and she consented to come. She'll tell us a little bit about her experiences, and she'll try to answer whatever questions you may have. Don't make them too personal, but you could make them personal, because she's speaking from her own experience, not what she saw or read in the book from her own experiences. And so without further ado, I'm very glad to introduce to you Mrs. Isra, who will talk to you about her experiences in the Holocaust, and perhaps um, we might come to some kind of an understanding of how we might correct the world so that things like that don't happen again. Mrs. Isra. Hello, everybody. I'm a sole survivor of a family of eight. I was 14 years old at the time. My mother was 34. My father was 36. Uh, I left at 1944 to Auschwitz, we were taken there, and in 45 we came home. I was the only one left. I stayed in Auschwitz till January. I worked at sorting out clothing from the crematoriums. That was my job. And in January we evacuated on foot, three days and three nights. And then we were put into cattle wagons, standing room only. As the people died, 
there was room to squat. Then we arrived to Ravensbrück, which is another concentration camp. From there we went to um, Malchow, and then I was liberated. To tell you about the year that I lived through, it's impossible. Nobody can really believe it. It's very, very hard to talk about it even, because I lived for many, many months in Auschwitz, which is Birkenau. Um, there were four crematoriums burning day and night. I was on a top bunk, and you could, the sky was red. Day and night, the stench was unbelievable. Yet you didn't want to believe that it's really happening. When I asked, where's my mother? And if somebody would tell me, well, she's being burned, you said, crazy, it's not true. Because they did put in tranquilizers in the food. We never, we never had our periods from the minute we came, and we were half drugged, sort of. So you really didn't think clearly. And the idea was just to go on from day to day. Whatever they told you, that's what you did, and that was it. Um, I don't know if you want to ask me anything. I'll be glad to answer you. Yes? When you arrived at Auschwitz, what was you feeling? I mean, did you know you were going there? Or what kind of did I know? We were first, before that, we were kept in a, in a ghetto. We arrived after two days in a cattle wagon on the very terrible circumstances. When we arrived, you were supposed to line up. The cattle wagon doors opened and they said, line up, five to a line. We were, first they separated the men from the, uh, from the women. That left my father and grandfather on one side. We were six children and my mother, which meant seven. My mother was in front of me with the rest of the children and I was in the back. My mother went straight to the left and when he came to me, he said, is the child yours? Because I was carrying my youngest sister. I had a two-year-old sister. I was holding her in my arms. My mother presumed he was asking about me. She said, I'm her child. He said, well, give the child to your mother and go on this side. My mother didn't know what was waiting for us and um, she didn't want to separate it. So she said, she's only 14. She's a sick child, please let her come with me. But uh, that was Mengele. He had on white gloves, a dog by his hand. He grabbed me by the collar and says, this side. My mother kept crying, don't take her away. But he pushed me to this side. A few minutes later, I reminded myself that when we got off the cattle wagon, I had a bag of food. Whatever we walked off with was toast. And then I realized that my mother and the rest of the family is all on that side. And I have the food, whatever is available, that's what I have. So I started running back to the side, which was, you know, where they were going to be burned. So he looks at me with the dog in his hand. He calls me, idiot, where are you going? I said, I just want to give my mother the food. I'll be right back. He let me give her the food. Then I went on this side. As I was walking, my father was hollering from the other side. He asked me, where's your mother? I pointed to that side. He passed that in front of my eyes. I knew he was in forced labor, so was I. I mean, he was in concentration camp, but he never made it home. In March, they shot the whole transport. Well, that's about it. That's, I mean, that was, uh, you know, but it was very hard to realize that what you were in because the facilities were very uh, nicely set up. Uh, trees, flowers were around it. You didn't realize when they told you they went to the showers, we questioned that away. Where's my mother? She went to take a shower. We went to showers. They shaved our hair off. Um, they took away your clothing and they gave you a uniform, <coughs> uniform, a gray dress or a gay dress. Uh, so it was easy to believe that your mother someplace else, she can't work. My mother had five younger children. So I presume she's someplace else. And uh, nobody wanted, you don't want to believe such things. Even if you see it with your own eyes, you don't want to believe it. I worked afterwards at selecting the clothing out. As you got undressed in the crematorium, you put the clothing down, and somebody would take a, a sheet and wrap up all the clothing in bundles. And then they put them into barracks. And our job was to sort out the clothing. The shoes went with the shoes, the dress with the dresses, and the jewelry, if you found any, you had to turn it in. Now, I came across the bundle of clothing that my mother and, and my, you know, the family got undressed with. 
Then I had to reface it that they were burned. So I passed out, they spilled some water on me, and the bundle disappeared. But you, that was three months later already, by the time I came to the bundle. Even then, you didn't want to believe it. Would you like that? Did you know what was going to happen? No. No. Absolutely not. The commun communications wasn't what it is today. We had no idea. We knew things were bad. We were going to be taken to work. But why would people want to kill all those people? Why? We were young and capable. Uh, we were willing to work. They took away everything, our home and uh, everything. But we didn't think that we were going to get killed. Yes. What did I? I was 15. I was sick. And uh, six weeks I was, um, was kept in a uh, detention, like uh, the Russians had uh, detention camps, like, or whatever. I came home, and I was hoping to find my father. My father went to forced labor, uh, to a concentration camp. And every, I was sure he'd come home, because he was only 36 years old, and he was a very talented, capable man. And uh, I came home to look for him. I found empty. Everything was empty. Everything was destroyed. They picked up the floors and the walls, the population in our community. They were looking for things. There was nothing left, not even a postcard, not even a picture, nothing. So I took the train, and I went to the following town which my mother was born in. She came from a big family. There were 12 um, sisters and brothers. So then I found my mother's two sisters who came back from concentration camp were there, and a brother who a Christian hid out in an attic for a year. He came back, and we all sat up together, and uh, a little while later we heard that that part of the country belongs now to Russia, and they were going to close the borders. You weren't going to be able to come out. So uh, we left for Germany for a detention camp, for a DP camp, and from there we came here. But we discovered um, relatives here. In Wilmington, Delaware, my mother had an uncle, and he wrote us a letter, and he sent an affidavit and papers, and he got us here. Yes. How old were you here? One year. One year? Yes. What did you bring to 1944, May, and I came, and I was liberated in June, 1945. Where were you before 1944? Yes, not long, just a few months. As of after 1939, a lot of trouble started. My father was in forced labor on and off. You could not go to schools, only elementary schools. Um, high school was out for Jewish people. You wore, the, you wore a yellow star. Uh, businesses were taken away, permits for businesses. We had a textile store. When the Hungarians came in in 1938, that was the first thing they took away was a permit to operate a business. And it isn't like here where the industry is so big. You couldn't go on and get a job uh, to do anything. So it was meant, you know, you couldn't make a living. It's, things are very, very hard. Yes. Motivation, stay alive. Hard. My father. I saw my father. He was alive. And I started thinking, he'll come home. And he's the only one. I mean, he will be the only one coming home. The whole family was destroyed. How is he going to survive? How is he going to, I must come home. So when we evacuated in January, I mean, it's indescribable. We walked on foot for three days and three nights in a snowstorm. And the winters there are very, very hard. It's not like here. And uh, we had no clothing. Don't forget, this was after a half a year of not eating. And um, I kept looking to see if there, if I saw on the ground. The people who couldn't make it were shot or froze on the, on, the, on the ground. And I kept looking to see, maybe I see my father, so I don't have to walk anymore, because I couldn't walk. But I didn't see him, and I said, I must come home, I must come home, my father is home, what's he gonna do? You know, so that was the drive, that was the only thing that drove me. And as a matter of fact, when he didn't come home, in the beginning people told me, oh, I was with your father in this camp, and he worked in a coal mine, and he, he was, Extremely, he knew you were alive and he wanted to come home the worst way. So I thought he's coming home. But when I heard he wasn't coming home, that he didn't make it, that they shot the whole transport, I wanted to commit suicide. This was after the concentration camp already. Because what's, why go on? What's that to go on for? But by that time, my mother's sisters were there. And uh, 
They were very good to me. And you go on. I was married at a very young age. I came here. I was 19, I was married. I married a fellow who was born here. And thank God I've been very fortunate. But uh, it's something you never forget. You can't, I mean, uh, years I had nightmares after I had my children. Especially my oldest daughter. I would wake up at night screaming, don't take her away, she's big. And I was all perspired. And, and my husband would say, again, here's another. I never went to sleep with one nightgown. I always had a few lined up because I'd wake up screaming and all wet. And I could never figure out, I said, why don't I remember I'm safe? But you didn't. It took years, and even then, certain things would set you off. Like uh, when my daughter graduated from high school, she was 13, and she wanted her first pair of heels. We were very conservative, our children went, you know, so she wanted heels. So I bought her a pair of shoes, and I remember at night having the nightmare again, because when I went to concentration camp, I wore a pair of shoes which had heels, not a walking shoe, and my shoes fell apart the first thing People who had regular walking shoes had for months later shoes, but I was without shoes after six or seven weeks because the, sh the shoes fell apart. So that left such an impression on me. When I bought for my daughter her shoes, her first heels, I had this nightmare again that she, she's walking barefoot, that she's walking in wooden shoes. So things always keep setting you off. So it took me years. I would never talk about it. My children were already quite big. They would ask me, no, you don't have, I don't have a mother. No, we don't have any, nobody. My husband, thank God, had family, and uh, they would be the substitutes, but I never discussed it. I just couldn't bring myself to talk about it until many, many years later. I, it was too hard, yes. Did you, like, blame the allies for standing around while all these people were being killed? Absolutely, now I do. At the time, I was too young to really know anything, and I remember my father discussing constantly, oh, President Roosevelt won't stand by, no, no, don't worry. I mean, we were, that was part of Hungary. Before that, they picked up the Jews from Slovakia, they picked up the Jews from Poland, that was many, many years ago. And, uh, but we didn't know, you know, that they were gassing them, mass gassing them, and they're killing them. We felt, you know, they were working hard and they were torturing them, but not mass I can't allow myself to feel or to think about it because it's, I, I, I'm not really very rational on that subject. The hate is there, you don't get over it, it's something like that. You just can't get over it. To the point where my daughter, my oldest daughter, wanted to take in college German, I wouldn't let her. It was many, many years later. She's a dermatologist, and she felt she needed the language. I said, can't you take any other language but German? I can't bear it. Yes? How did you feel, um, I mean, how did the Germans treat you at the concentration camp for so long? you placed... They didn't stay around. And the, uh, before the liberation, we found ourselves all alone. The guards just disappeared. We were left alone and, all, and on our own. They disappeared. How did the citizens treat you? I mean, did you say that you... I did not stay long there. The next, within a few days, we got a, a Russian, the Russians liberated us, and a Jewish boy got us a horse and a wagon, and we started back towards Krakow. In Krakow, they had uh, cattle wagons, but we were equipped with food and medication. Uh, I suffered from diarrhea, this you know, whatever I ate came back, and I was sick, very sick for six weeks. But they tried feeding me with all kinds. And then we came, I came home with that wagon, uh, with a cattle wagon. But they were, you know, much more comfortable. You could sit there, you could lay down, and there was food available. Yes? Yes, absolutely. First, my uncle was saved by a Christian. He kept him in an attic for 11 months. My only cousin who came back, we were 22 grandchildren. I have only one cousin who came home and she was taken to the capital of Hungary by a Christian. It's true, he was paid very handsomely for his troubles, but nevertheless, he could have very well taken the stuff and, uh, and uh, handed her in, but he didn't. And the same goes for my uncle, my mother's only brother. 
is alive today because this Christian kept him on his attic, in his attic for 11 months. He brought him food up and everything to care of him. Yes? What about, what? Yes. What about it? Um, how was it like? It was very bad. Undescribable. We were in a, in a, it was before where they made the bricks, a factory. So it had only the bottom. <coughs> it had no top. And everybody would put sheets to, cr to make their own enclosure. Each family was in one of those places where you dried the bricks. We didn't stay there long, though. We were only there four weeks. Was there ever resistance? Um, was there resistance more than that? Not from us, no. We didn't know what was waiting for us. Yes? How do you feel about the Germans? I still like, love them. I don't even like them. I can't really bear to be around them. It's just something that you don't get over with. Yes? Um, did anybody like uh, try to resist in the concentration camp? Or try to do what? To resist. You couldn't. There was no such a thing. We were in Birkenau, Auschwitz. It had wires all around it. There were four crematoriums on each corner. You, you were called in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, to stand sail up there. You stood hours. And if you went near the wire, you were electrocuted. Nobody tried to resist anything. Every four weeks they had the lousing, it was called. You, wore, you had only the clothes which you were wearing. There was no... Uh, Back, I mean, no showers or anything. The only shower you got was when you went every four weeks that you got undressed. They put your clothing into a machine to kill the lights and worm in it, and then you got a shower. You stayed there a whole night till your clothes got dry and then uh, clean, and then you went back to your bunk. We used to get a piece of soap that was cold water on the, in a faucet, and a piece of soap that was made out of human bodies, human fat. That was it. And the only clothing we had, what we were wearing. And of course, uh, it had lights in it and whatnot in every four weeks. And as you were undressed, that's when the selections were made. You had to raise your hand, you paraded around naked, and the Germans with it, the SS were there, it used to be mostly Mengele. And if you were too skinny, he felt, you, they called you a Muslim. In other words, you were too skinny, he sent you to be burned. Yes? Once they knew that they were going to be part of the neighborhood, their selection, and they were selected. Right. They just try any kind of resistance. What could you do? You were put into a box. There was absolutely nothing. I had a cousin with me. She was also the same age as I was. She was selected out in October, not in October, in September yet. She was a tall, thin child. And she was selected out. She not only accepted, she, she lost her mind. She, she said, I'm going to heaven, it's great, and wonderful. She was thinking, she was happy. That's it. Yes. Uh, do you think there's a God, like while you were in here suffering, do you think there was a God up there that would let this happen to you? Well, I'll tell you something. I come from a very orthodox family. My father, I mean, I was raised as a very orthodox child, and uh, to this day, my children are orthodox, and we are, my husband is orthodox. When I came back, I was very rebellious, and I said there couldn't be a God there. How could he possibly let all this happen? Especially when I looked around and my father was a very righteous man, an orthodox man, and my mother and all they concentrated and was doing good. And he got killed and everybody got killed. And the people who I felt weren't good uh, came home. So I was very rebellious for a few months. But then I decided you cannot escape what you were brought up and what you, you were in. And that somehow you had these guilt feelings about you. So even if I rebelled as far as orthodoxism was concerned, I felt very guilty and I went back to it. Yes? Did you feel guilty because he survived? You were one of the few that survived? No, I didn't feel guilty. I felt I had to come home for my father's sake, and that was the only reason I came home at the time. And later on, I felt, you see, when we went to concentration camp and the cattle wagons, I can always saw my father, my mother, praying, sitting. My mother was praying that God should spare her from pain watching her children suffer. No matter what happened till now, she said, it's okay, but God, please spare me the pain that a child of mine should ever ask for food, and I should say, I haven't got it, or I should, you know, watch the child suffer. 
And my father kept praying, please God, spare at least one of my children. We shouldn't be completely wiped out. So I felt that this was his prayer, and this was the only reason I came home for. So I got married at a very young age, and within 10 months I had a baby. And I tried to raise my children in the way my father raised me and wanted it. I have four children, and this is the kind of life I'll eat. Yes? At the ripe old age of nine years old, uh, the Hungarians came in, and the first thing they did was uh, take away my father's permit. He had a textile store. He could not uh, open the business. And um, you couldn't go to school if you wanted to. After the fourth grade, they have a different schooling system where I was. After the fourth grade, you made a change and all that. You weren't qualified because you were a Jew. No matter what your marks were, you couldn't uh, go into high school or even in, cl in the classroom. I, had all, I deserved an A, but I didn't get it. She'd give me a B or a C, and I'd say, why did you give it to me? She says, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to give you an A. You're, not, you're, you're, not, you're Jewish, I can't give it to you. That's all there is to it, yes. Did you feel this was going to go on forever? I mean, for a long, long time? Well, I didn't think that it would ever come to an end, or, but yet you never gave up hope. Even when, when you, at one point, I had jaundice, and we had no mirror. People would get blown up, and you'd see this was it. You start to recognize the symptoms. This was already in April, and you knew that was it that you're dying. And I, we were standing, sail up, and I saw there was a puddle of rain, and I looked, and I saw I was all swollen and jaundiced. And I said to the girl who was standing next to me, I'm swollen and yellow, right? This is it. She says, no, oh, you're imagining it. So I, would, I fell asleep, and at night I'm dreaming that I died, and I came to my mother, and I was giving her an argument up in heaven. I said, what are you complaining? You had it easy. You didn't know what it was like, the torture of a year, the, the horrible things. You didn't know what was waiting for you. You were gassed and killed. But look at me and my father. And... Uh, but you really never gave up. Even no matter what, you always hope maybe you'll come out. Maybe it'll be a different world. Yes. You went all through all that when you liberated. Did you believe in Russia? Did I believe what? No. We were left alone on the roadside, and all of a sudden we just uh, we sat down to rest, and the the soldiers were gone. You saw. I mean, they were coming, closing. You know, you the sky was red from the bombs and and everything. But we didn't, we didn't know what to do. We just, you know, you take a 15-year-old child all alone, you, you don't know what's what. Yes? Have you ever seen any of, like, the Nazis that they escaped and they're over here? Have you ever seen any of them? No. I try not to go around there at all, where, you know, where Germans are. Yes? Um, how did the Germans first approach you, like, to say, um, take you to the camps or something like that? Put you into a ghetto? They, uh, they collected everybody. They came to the house and put you into the ghettos. You, everybody had to report. And you gathered, they gathered you together and they took you into the ghettos. And, and after that, they collected each transport on the cattle wagons and they took you to Auschwitz. Did you know any uh, Jews maybe that uh, said it were not Jewish and said it were cattle? Oh, yes. That went on from as of 1939. There were a lot of conversions in our classrooms even, but it didn't help. They took them away anyway. Yes? Do you ever feel resentment that the uh, United States could have helped and didn't, that the government intentionally decided not to bomb the railroad tracks like the concentration? At the time, I was not a man. That all the evidence was there for years, in 1941 and 42, that this is what the Nazis were doing, that they said they were going to do it, and that the American government intentionally decided to let it happen. Not accidentally, intentionally let it happen. I read about it plenty you after. You and resentment, and don't you have all More the feelings for the United States government and the American people? Well, the government certainly was wrong as far as I was concerned, and I certainly, when I read it, my husband was born here, and then when he showed me the articles and all that, of course, you know, your blood starts to boil. And you can't understand how is it possible? How do people be like that? How do you let things like that happen? But then I saw people be become really, under certain circumstances, people turn to be animals, not human beings.
but Americans were not. I know. And the American government took bulk loads of escaped refugees and turned them back. And That's sent right. And them back to Germany where the people were gassed when they got back. Isn't it hard to live in a country that did that? Well, the country afterwards was good to me, and I have to forget the past. I do have four children, and uh, they're fine. You try to hope that things will change. Right now, with the boat people, it's terrible. When I think about it, I get sick. When I read uh, or see on television what's going on, that you let people again over and over suffer, and nobody's lifting a pinky to do anything about it. It's sickening. Things really haven't changed. Yes. I've been a citizen for many, many years. My husband was born here. Been a citizen, yes. How did you think you were all that? I mean, you feel your death in here all the time, you know? I, th I had one drive. I had to come home for one reason, my father. And uh, it was just meant to be. I was selected out, and, and this was already the end of the November when they didn't burn. They took all my blood and sent it to the German soldiers. Did you actually walk over people while you were walking in the dead? Did I? I walked when I evacuated in a snowstorm. All I did was walk over a body, and very often I turned over. I wanted to see if it's not my father there. So I don't have to walk anymore. Yes? When you were in Auschwitz, did you know of uh, the terrible experiments that Dr. Mengele was performing? Yes, yes. I had a, a twin cousin, and uh, they were being experimented on. How did you react? You couldn't react. There was nothing you could do. First of all, most of the time you were really drugged. You didn't know what was going on half the time. There was nothing you can do. The only thing you can do is either touch the, the wires or be, uh, what do you call, burned. Yes? What would you feel like you could be next to the um, experiment or you could die before that? Well, I was going to be burned. I was going to be burned. I didn't. Did you were going to be chosen for the experiment? No, I wasn't going to be chosen for the experiments. They had no reason. I was scared all the time that fear was with you constantly. Every time there was a selection, yeah, you're going to be the next one. Yes. Oh, yes. Because when we lived, where we lived, my father, like five generations before, they were born in that particular city. And when people escaped from Poland, and they told my father, so he says, now, nah, how could, how could, where could, why would they take us? Upright citizens, my grandfather and great-grandfather was before here. And they wouldn't. They couldn't possibly. Not the Hungarians. We're civilized people. Why would they want to hurt us? The Hungarians <coughs> helped. Oh, they cooperated beautifully with the Germans. They were very anxious to be helpful in destroying us and taking everything away. Yes? Do you have a feeling for revenge? No. Revenge is... In the beginning, I felt that things would change, and whoever came home was going to really have, it's going to be a different world. But slowly you realize things really didn't change. People are the same, uncaring, some care. Yes? What was your reaction to the liberators? I mean, what did they were Russians. They were soldiers. They were out to have a good time. You had to be careful. But we weren't that pleased to be liberated by them, okay? Yes. Did you ever say to yourself, why me? Why me? Why my whole family? Yes, sometimes. There was no answer, though. Thank you. You're welcome. I gave you some more It's all right. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Lisa. Uh, it was a very different world, actually. It was different here too when I was uh, when I was born, but uh, in Europe it was much more different. Uh, my parents were very orthodox to see them. Uh, I was the oldest of six children. And we lived in a small town, like, um, by uh, American standards, by other standards, it's considered a small town. But it wasn't considered so small. It had over 7,000 Jews, and most of them were very orthodox. And life was very different than it's nowadays, for the simple reason we uh, did not have the, uh, the conveniences that you have.
out. For example, we had no um, uh, running water. Um, we used to get water from the well. We had no steam heat. Um, so our life was much, much harder. Physically. But spiritually, it was very, very nice. Uh, it was warm, very loving, very, uh, our parents were very prone. And uh, life revolved around new religion. My father got up every morning, went to the mikvah, and learned first, then he went to Dhamma, and then he went to work. Uh, my mother had to make fire, and that wasn't like that you turn on the, the gas ranch or anything. You had to take pieces of wood and make fire. The water had to be brought in from the outside, from the well. And it was a big job. Till you set up breakfast was a couple of hours' work. Uh, we started school early in the morning. We stayed in school usually until 12.30. 12.30, came home. We ate our main meal, lunchtime. Our father would come home from the business, and uh, we had a regular meal, a big meal, like you have dinner now, huh? Flesh chicken or whatever. And he would uh, stay home till about two o'clock. Usually, he played with us. Um, or he had other things to take care of, but he did not go back to business till about two o'clock. And uh, it was clothing was very, very. Um, we didn't have a lot of clothes. You had one outfit for Shabbos, in the summertime, a summer dress, and in the wintertime, a winter dress. And. Uh, for, uh, then when you came home in a school dress, when you came home, you took it off and you put it in your, in your um, uh, play, clothes. play clothes, whatever it was. It wasn't really play clothes, the old clothes, let's put it that way. The old clothes, the worn clothes. And um, that's the way life went, more or less, till I was about nine. After nine, things got much worse because the war broke out. Playing our toys, we didn't have too many toys. A lot of the toys we made ourselves. Uh, I remember making up when I was little. Uh, for my match box, we put on rubber bands, and uh, that was a musical toy. We made our own uh, rag doll. Uh, we were, you know, uh, we made clothing for them, from scraps, whatever was around. Ball we played. Um, jump rope. All the children, and of course, um, you have. We had much more space than here because um, we lived in a small town. It's like living in the country, you know. They have trees and grass around, and so, so it was a really a, a very nice life in a way. It was very hard physically, but it was nice anyway. We were happy. We did not have an unhappy childhood. In the, in the summertime, we only got four weeks vacation. We went to school till about uh, end of July, and then you had four or five weeks off. Before the war, the four five, five weeks we spent like um, we went to our grandparents who lived in another town, or we went for vacation uh, up to the uh, mountains. So we lived in, uh, for a little further away where the Carpathian Mountains, they had mineral there. Uh, they had a lot of uh, mountainous areas where you had, um, we used to pick hazelnuts, blueberries.